Let's worship the Lord in listening right now because I think what's more important is not that he hears our voice, but that we hear his. The life doesn't come from us, it comes from him. Come on, amen. Second Timothy chapter 3. I want to start at verse number 3. Reading from the New King James Version. Paul's words to Timothy. The heading in my Bible said perilous times and perilous men. Danger. I, when I read that, I thought of, well, I'm going to date myself here, but I thought of danger, Will Robinson, danger. And I saw the arms, the flailing arms of a robot warning a young man. And here the apostle is like that robot flailing his pen to warn this young preacher about what is ahead. Verse 3, but know this, that in the last day, Perilous times will come. If you were to ask him why, he's about to tell you right here. For or because men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. That means they hate, they hating on your good. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. Look at somebody and tell them you need to get away from these people. Now, now here's the news. These people that he just described as lovers of themselves and money and bolsters and proud and blasphemous and disobedient to parents and unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power of. All 18 of those descriptors are not about people in the world. It's about people at church. He's writing to the church, not the world. And he's talking about who you can come together with and who you can't come together with, who you need to turn away from. From such people, let me add the Maldonado version, in the church, turn away. Look at your neighbor now and tell him, beware, danger. They're all around you. Turn away. I want to preach from this subject and I'm going to ask you to repeat it with me. And I don't want you to be too proud not to say it. I don't want you to be too carnal not to be obedient and be a part of the group. So be a part of the group. Amen. But I do want you to repeat the following words. Say the enemy is I. Lord have mercy. The enemy is I. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Now I need you all to help me preach tonight. Uh, I need you because I, the Lord's given me a word, but uh, my back is out. I'm wearing a brace. I've got pinched nerves. I'm on, a, I'm on meds, but I'm standing here and I got a chair that I'm about to lean on so that I can give you whatever God is saying to give you. Amen. So I need your help just to come alongside me while I'm preaching. Can you do that? Can you be what uh, we call active listeners? Uh, I, need you to, I need you to understand the word of the Lord tonight is so important. When I, was, when I was praying about what's going to happen, Lord, what is it that you want us to do? What is it you want us to focus on at this, at this Disciples Congress? Congress because we're gathering ourselves to legislate God's words and command in our heart, in our mind. Congress because... We're coming together as his legislative body in the earth. 
the church, the people who are to rule and reign on behalf of Christ, the kingdom of God in the earth through the church. As we are in Congress sessions this week, I said, God, what is it that you want us to focus on all week long? He gave me one word. The word was together. I thought about that together. Um, and I said, well, maybe it's because we've been through this pandemic. We're still in this pandemic. And being together has been interrupted. Uh, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, the pandemic has not interrupted your togetherness. It's revealed it. I wish I had someone in here. I told you I need a church. Your, the, the pandemic has not interrupted your ability to be together. It has revealed your desire to be together. It has revealed uh, theology about togetherness. It has revealed the mind of individualism in the church that I'll speak about in just a few. The pandemic has not truly interrupt your being together because at the end of the day, our togetherness is not about physical space only. While we do value physical spaces and we value physical gathering, we have learned that for the moment we can't come together physically, but we can still come together in spirit. Paul wrote to the, Thessalon to the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, and he had told them in his first letter, and it was the first of all the letters Paul penned. In his very first apostolic letter, he tells them, I wanted to come and see you many times, but Satan has what? Hindered me. I can't come to you physically. I'm hoping to get there soon. The times that I've attempted, something has hampered the attempt. I can't get to you physically. However, Paul never claimed that his physical absence meant that they were not together. He speaks to the church as children who are breastfeeding from the breast of their mother. He is nurse feeding them. He is nursing them along even though they're at a distance. He did it through his technology. He didn't have Zoom. He didn't have Facebook. He had a feather and some ink and he had a piece of paper, some parchment to write on. He had couriers to take his letter from one place like Epaphroditus from one place to another like Titus and Timothy who could carry his letters to the places and in the presence of the church through the technology of letter writing Paul was able to be together with them. He was together with them. I, I'm telling you that I prayed and I said God what is it that we need to why is it you're talking about together? He says, because the real thing that has been revealed here in the pandemic is the theological weakness, uh, the, the, the false way of seeing and understanding what church is and what God's call is for each and, for each and every one of us Christians. That there is an individual call and there is a collective call, but too many of us are unable to answer the call because we are given to a way of thinking and being that is not Christ-like. What has happened is that we have been disconnected, not because of COVID-19, but because of the lack of Christ-likeness. Oh, I wish I, I, I could... I could say it the way I understand it and know it and feel it. God, give me grace and favor to deliver this word to you tonight. The enemy is I. To gather comes from this basic word in the English language. Together uh, comes from this basic thought of to gather. To bring into one group, into a place. To mass or amass. To collect, unify aggregate, put into a unit. When we talk about being together, we're talking about being one unit, not many. We're talking about an assembly. As a matter of fact, in your Bibles, often depending on the version you use, a lot of times instead of the word together, the word that the scriptures use is the word to get, uh, is assembly or gathering. The church is a called out assembly. People who are called out of darkness into light to what? come together to assemble. It was interesting to me that while we were all in our own homes, separated, the number one movies that were crushing it at the box office and now during COVID online were the Avengers. And the whole call of the Avengers is Avengers assemble. 
You may not be a Marvel or a superhero fan, but just know a bunch of superheroes come together because they hear a clarion call that says, come together. Assemble. I have, we have some sound issues. It's our first night, so if you're online watching us in here, be a little bit patient. We'll work out the echoes and things so that we can hear clearly. Amen? But we'll get it together. We'll get it together. Amen. Look at somebody say together. <laughs> Uh, just just to be clear, so you know what I'm talking about when I when I say together, the opposite of together then is to be what apart, to be apart, to be separated, to be independent, to be individualized, to be single handed, to be solely. You say the problem is what the problem is that too many Christians are trying to follow Jesus on their own terms, in their own way. The way they think it's best, the way they want it to be best, the way they think it should be for them. Now, Paul is writing to the church. Uh, Paul is writing to the church and he's telling them, listen, in the, in the last days, there's going to be a lot of problems. Uh, uh, and, and, and Paul is not just speaking prophetically about the future. Someone says, when is this scripture going to come to pass? He wasn't just speaking about the future. Clearly, he's speaking about his time because he's writing to people in his day in his church. But he was also reflecting on the past as well as the future. He brings up Janice and Jambres in a few verses. He talks about Moses and the challenge that he had because of people in his congregation. And so he's saying this is not a new problem. This is something that they saw then. This is something we're seeing now. This is something we're going to see in the future. And all of these problems Problems. Lovers of money, uh, leadership that are proud, leaders who are blasphemers, leaders who are who are. And, and I say leaders because if you read the context of the book of, Ch uh, of Second Timothy, you'll find out he's talking to Timothy about leaders in the church who are this way, who are corrupting the way the church should behave. And he's talking about this kind of leadership and this kind of model and patterns that we have. And we don't realize it. But when we have that kind of leadership before us, we emulate it. We imitate it. We, we justify it in our minds and say, this is all right. This is the way the leader does it. And we think it's OK. And he begins to describe it and he begins to call out all these things. I told you there's 18 descriptors here. Lovers of money and boasters and proud and blasphemers and disobedient and unloving and unforgiving and slanders and without self-control. And he begins to call all these out. But really, all of them are sourced in one thing. He says, the problem is that perilous times will come, and this is why, for men will be lovers of themselves. And loving yourself leads to loving money. Loving yourself leads to being boastful. Loving yourself leads to a lack of self-control. Loving yourself leads to being a pleasure, a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. Loving yourself leads to unholy living, leads to unloving living, leads to being unforgiving, leads to being a slanderer because you love yourself. You love yourself. And again, the issue is that Paul is calling this out in the church. In, in, in the most famous writings of John Calvin, the great reformer of the 15th century, in, in, in the tomes of his writing is a series of books that are written called uh, the, the, the Institutes of Religion. Book one, book two, book three, book four, each of them several hundred pages long, each of them tackling the issues of what church is about, what God is about, what Christianity is about. In his fourth book, John Calvin, this, this, this father in French begins to write and describe what the church is and what the church isn't. And in that first, in that fourth book, in the first chapter of the fourth book, right around the seventh point, he writes these words. He says, in this church, there is a very large mixture of hypocrites who have nothing of Christ. Now, that the subject, listen, by this church father is Christology and ecclesiology. He's describing who Jesus is. He's describing what the church is. And John Calvin says about the church of Jesus Christ that in this church, there's a very large mixture of hypocrites who have nothing of Christ but the name and an outward appearance of ambitious, av avarice, envious, evil speaking men some also, also of impure lives. 
Y'all, y'all got this? He says they're avarice, they're evil speaking, they're envious, they carry the name of Jesus and they belong to the church, but they're not really Christian. And he says, and the problem here is that some are eviler than others. I, may, I just said eviler because he says some have impurer lives. Some are impure and others are more impurer, <laughs> according to John Calvin. It's in old English. It was actually in old French. Impure lives, watch this, who are tolerated for a time. Why would God allow all that in the church? Who are what? Tolerated for a time. Either because their guilt cannot be legally established. The reason we got them in the church is because we can't clearly reveal what they're doing, but we know they're there. You all act like you've seen preachers like this. Who cannot be legally established or because due strictness of discipline is not always observed. In other words, John Calvin says the reason these kind of leaders exist and these kind of Christians exist in the church is either because we haven't found them out exactly yet enough to put it out on the table. Or that when it is confronted, someone gives them an escape and doesn't hold them to true accountability in Christ. But for some reason or another, we have hypocrites in pulpits. Hypocrites in pews. People who really don't have a love for Jesus, who have more of a love for themselves. And I'm telling you, when I was praying about this Congress and I said, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? He said, talk about being together and the enemy of together. The enemy is I. the enemy of us together is me individually. The enemy of the group of the collective is the individual. The enemy of us as a people is me as a person. You say, what are you talking about? That the gospel, and this is nothing new if you've heard me preach sometime. You know I've been talking about this for quite a while. The gospel has become for many or has always been for some nothing more than radical individualism Christianized. What are you saying, Bishop? Radical individualism is what it's become, not only in our generation, like I said, but in Paul's day, in Moses' day, people have always gravitated to themselves and only thought about what? Me, myself, and I. The enemy is I. Radical individualization, this individualism, is when you begin to interpret the world through the filter of I. Hear me. You begin to interpret ministry through I. You begin to interpret the church through what I think. I tell you what I think. Don't need to know what you think. Tell me what Christ thinks. Tell me what scripture says. Tell me what the Christ has shown us. Give me the model of Jesus. But everything is interpreted, the world, the church, ministry, through I. The gospel through the lens of self. You know lenses. You put on a shaded lens and everything you look through that lens is that shade. And the problem is we have interpreted scripture. We've interpreted prayer. We've interpreted worship through the lens of I. When I pray, I don't seek intimacy with Christ. I seek what I need. Y'all ain't hearing me. When I worship, it's not even really about exaltation. It's what I want. Worship is no longer an end in itself. It is a means to an end. We worship because I need something. I sing because I'm happy. We say it in our very lyrics. Uh, 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 What happens when you're not happy? I don't sing. What what happens when you pray and he doesn't answer you? Can he get you to pray what he wants you to pray? Why should I pray? I said this in Bible study last night. Why should I pray if God knows what I need anyways? What made you think that prayer was only about what you needed? When does prayer become a dialectical spiritual exercise? One in which you're not just talking to God, but God is talking to you. How about God giving you a prayer list for you to pray? 
How about you stop treating Jesus like he's your 365 day a year Santa Claus? Will you come in prayer and sit on his lap and give him your own wish list? Prayer is about the I. When individualism has overcome you, you begin to filter prayer through I. You begin to filter singing and worship and songs and dancing for I. Why can't you just dance because he's worthy of your dance? Why does your dance have to be connected to whether or not you're going to get a breakthrough tonight? I wish I had a church in here. I wish someone could dance just because God wants us to dance before him. Not because I dance so I can get something from God. When does your spiritual life stop revolving around you? When spiritual activities revolve around you, you study scripture for you. You, 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 you pray for yourself. You fast for yourself. You give for yourself. We have a hard time because we filter everything through the lens of self. It becomes abusive. It becomes reckless. Paul says when you have these kind of leaders in the church who are in it for the eye, they don't even preach for the sake of the people. They preach for what they can get from the people. He said to the to the church in the book of Acts chapter 20, for three years, I was with you, warning you that men would be lovers of themselves, that they were going to come in wearing sheep clothing and they were going to be here manipulating you and taking you for whatever they can get from you. Watch out. There are people who are in this for themselves. It's so easy to identify it in others, so difficult to see it in our own self. Paul says it becomes abusive and it becomes reckless. And he's warning Timothy in this letter about the hazards of a self-absorbed Christianity. Now, let me help you to understand this individualism just a bit further. Individualism, when I'm speaking of it, it refers to this doctrine uh, where you promote your self-interest. It's the doctrine that the interests of the individual are or ought to be ethically paramount. That the most important thing here is what I can get out of this. That I'm going to say amen if it's good for me. But if it's not good for me, I won't say amen to it. That I'll give my time and I'll give my money and I'll jump through the hoops and I'll make the sacrifice if I see fit for it. But if I don't see it, there's no sense in doing it. It's a, not, it's a doctrine that is a, 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 um, a hidden belief within the psyche. It's a psychological thing. It's a philosophical one at the center and at the core of your being where you only do things for the best interest of self. And in this particular sense, individualism leads to self-reliance. And a distorted Christian identity where it isolates you from the collective, which is the very body of Christ. How can you be joined to Christ and his body when you only look at things through the lens of self? You can't. You can't. It's absolutely impossible. We live in a world where people are taught. We, we, we are indoctrinated from even before the birth out of the womb. We're talking to babies while they're still in there, telling them who they're going to be and all they're going to be and how special they are. And it's true. They are special and it's true. They're going to be great things. But we teach them, we indoctrinate them in language, in affection, in, in, in prospects, in visions, in dream casting. We build a person up to look out for themselves. And the problem is how this philosophy has become so pervasive in our culture. It's become such a part of the world. It is the ethos in which the world operates. Everyone is in it for themselves. So much so that you can't really trust other people because you have to ask yourself, what's in it for them? Before you can make an honest and moral and ethical decision, you have to stop and think, I got to think what kind of malice can be in their own heart. 
Because I cannot simply believe that people would give up everything just because God said so. Oh, God sent me, Bishop. But as soon as they don't get their way, Pastor Myra, y'all don't, y'all, you don't understand. Oh, the Lord told me. But as soon as the eye is offended, y'all ain't hearing me. The problem is that this philosophy and this pervasive ethos is the overall drive of our society. That we live in a culture of individualization and it's now as it was then, it still is now and perhaps even more so now because culture itself has taken a hold of this. It is, it is endangering the gospel message. The danger that I'm talking about is the Christian version of this sin. Y'all ain't hearing this. I'm not talking about the clear, obvious things where you have, you know, billionaires who are so self-absorbed they don't do anything for the poor. That's clear. That's a clear sin. I'm not just talking about those people out there only for themselves. They don't help other people out. No, that's 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 a clear that it, there's nothing obscure there. It's out. It's open. It's evident. What I'm talking about is the Christian version of this. What I'm talking about is the sin of self where your worship and your self-identity is really connected to self-aggrandizement. Y'all ain't hearing this in here. I'm responsible to shape preachers. I'm responsible to make and and help form leaders in the body of Christ. And I can't tell you how many people come to to, to be mentored or to be trained and to come to classes and to come and learn uh, uh, theology and to come and and be and and come to ordination services, receive hands on them. And how proud, beaming, shining proud they are that God has called them to ministry. You say, shouldn't they be proud? Sure, they should be proud. My question is, why are you so proud? And unfortunately, the answer for so many in our day is that they're proud because for them, this is not a time to get low. This is an opportunity to be high and lifted up. We call them elevation services. We don't call them lowering services. We don't call them abasement servicemen. We call them elevations. We call them enthronements. As if they are now going to be lording and being a king and reigning as a queen over some great thing. We call them these things because behind the ethos, behind the thinking is this thought that I am getting bigger. Oh, I'm about to be known. World, get ready. Here comes minister so and so. We promote ourselves. We begin to do all type of marketing. Come on, somebody. Because we're given to self-loathing, self-rewarding, self-centeredness. Y'all ain't helping me. Self-absorption. And we're truly diametrically opposed to the way of Christ diametrically opposed to the church of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about leadership, y'all. All All right, maybe I'm just talking to three folk in here, but but listen, I'm going to talk to y'all three just for a minute. I don't know who I'm talking to out there, but I'm going to talk to you if you need to hear this. Listen, listen, there is a danger right now like I've never seen before. Maybe I'm just awakened to this now. It's always been there, but I've never seen it. But maybe or maybe social media is helping me to see it even more. You know, just like we're seeing more crimes against black and brown people, not because it hadn't been there, just because now we got cameras everywhere. And now that we live in an age of selfie ministries, y'all ain't hearing this. We like to promote ourselves more than Christ. It is becoming more apparent to me that people take the opportunity to have ministry. Y'all ain't hearing this. Ministry is an opportunity for them, for their self. You say, well, I ain't a preacher. I am no leader. I am, I'm just a nobody in the church. Well, watch yourself. Because you might fall in these categories in different ways. You say, how much? Which way, Bishop? It starts with little things. It starts with little things that begin to corrupt the spiritual formation that you have. You may not even have recognized this any time. Hopefully, if what I'd say tonight helps you in any way, it helps you recognize that there's something wrong with the way you've been formed in Christ. 
maybe if you find this out, this can save your life, save your future, save your family, save your relationship with Jesus, save your ministry, save the way God wants to use you. You say, what are you talking about? It starts with little things in our formation, this radical individualism. It starts with thinking about myself. It starts with little thoughts like, what can I do to make myself happy? What's wrong with that, Bishop? Don't we deserve to be happy? I wouldn't say deserve. Ask the prophet what you deserve. And he won't talk to you. I'm talking about the Old Testament prophet. Or the New Testament prophet. Won't talk to you about what you deserve, but about the grace that you have been given. That Christ deserved from the Father and has been afforded to you. But your own works of righteousness, said Isaiah, are nothing more than what? Filthy rags. What you deserve is, is, is something different. But it starts with little thoughts like, how, how can I be happier? And what's best for me? And how do I get myself this? And how do I get myself that? I, I just want to be nicer for myself. I want it to be nicer. I want it to be a little bit better for myself. And then it begins to grow. It's like leaven. And it begins to grow and grow and ruin the whole lump. And it begins to be about self-preference. Y'all ain't hearing this. It begins to be about self-preference. So much so that it's so common right now. Like how people in the world right now, in our culture right now, they seek churches based on their preferences. I want to go to a church that I like. And I want to be at a church that... I like to hear the preacher and I like their music. I want to be somewhere where I like the people. I want to be somewhere where I like what's being offered. And the problem, you say, what's the problem with that, Bishop? Follow follow me. Stay with me for a second here. The, the, The problem is that we set this world up where the center of our spirituality is ourself and what ourself likes and prefers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was Last I read, Christ sets members in the church where he wills. He'll call you out to be a part of a people. He'll call you into ministries and call you into partnerships and call you into things. But, but because we're so self-driven, we live in this preference-driven church culture where we say things like, well, I don't know if I like that. And when when the spirituality is centered around your likes, hear me, hear me. When your spirituality is centered around your likes, we we make the assumption that what we like is what God Y'all, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that right there. I, I'm going to go to a place that I like. And the problem, Bishop, I need pastoral counsel is I like this church, but my wife likes that church. Come on. I want to be here and my children want to be over there. And, and it's not just about which church, but it could be which ministry to volunteer in. Y'all hearing me right now? W- w- which thing to obey Christ in? Whatever it is, God is leading to you. But we begin to filter it through the preference of I and what I like and what I want. And then we assume in that position that what we like must be what God likes. And if God likes what I like, then God's will is what I like. Therefore, my like is God's will. Hold on, somebody. You're not, no, no, I didn't just hear, did I just hear that? Did I say that that way? What I like must be what God likes, which presumes that if God likes it, then God wills it and if it's God's will and I like it then God's will is what I like and if I want to know God's will I really don't need to ask God I could just tell you because I could tell you what I like you have fallen into such a depravity of the soul and a disconnection from God that you have in essence done what Lucifer did Fall in love with your own privilege of worship before the throne. I heard a preacher say this years ago that the word for pride in in Hebrew, uh, it, it has an allusion to being blinded. And he says, if pride is blindedness, then that's how Lucifer fell. How did Lucifer fall when there was no sin in heaven? 
How did Lucifer fall? Who tempted Lucifer? Where did sin come from? I'll tell you where sin came from. Sin came from the very place it comes from us, the self. That God gave Lucifer and the angels that followed him the free ability to choose for themselves what they wanted. And at one point, here he is, the angel covering the throne of God. Y'all got to picture this. His job is to stand before God's throne as a covering. You cannot see no light that radiates from God unless Lucifer reveals the light to you. His job is to cover the throne while light is emanating from the throne. And he was so much there in the presence of God and his brilliance that his own name, Lucifer, means angel of light. But he absorbed so much light that he was blinded by the very light himself. The problem is sometimes you smell yourself too much. The problem is your own brilliance blinds you. Your own opinions and your own thoughts and your own glorious apex of spiritual experience and worship has blinded your ability to see how much you have fallen away from the very God you stand before. He was blinded by his own pride and fell like it. Hell like the pride that blinded him. And what happens is that we have exalted self so much that we figure that what we like, because God keeps letting us get away with it. Y'all ain't hearing this. That what we like, because we've been all right so far. That what we like, because God's blessed me anyway this long and this good, I must be on God's good side. I must have God's approval. I must have the will of God. I must have the blessing of God and the favor of God because all these things I have and I'm doing it while I live the way I want and make the decisions I want and be at the places I want to be and act the way I want to act. So I and God must be equal. In a sense, wave your hand if this is making sense to you right now. Wave your other hand if your eyes are opening up right now. What is the problem, Bishop? I'm just trying to go for what I prefer. Have you asked Jesus what he prefers for you? Before Christianity was Christianity, it was simply called the way. And the way is not you or your life. Jesus says, I am the way your job is to find the way and walk in the way christians were first called people of the way the problem is your way has become your new way not his way my way what we like is what god likes and what god wills for us and the bigger problem is that we have created a culture where we overlook others. We overlook God. We overlook others. Because all we can see is ourselves. We have amassed and built a massive deficiency in our life because we have cut every other voice out. No room for another voice. I got my own voice. Instead of moving away from self and towards others, we have moved away from others and towards ourselves. Pastor John Tyson says true spiritual formation will drive us beyond self and into the heart of the church. True spiritual formation drives us what? Beyond self into the heart of the church. Korean culture like others, considers it good and right for parents to make great sacrifices, to undergo superhuman suffering so that their children can have a better life. You know how that goes. Any parents in here made sacrifices so your kids can have it better. Uh, Korean culture makes these superhuman sufferings so that their children can have a better life. For example, parents may work dangerously long hours, even lose their health, in order to see their children having a better life for themselves so they can have good school, you know, and so they can have the things that they never had in their own life in order to guarantee for them a good future. And it's easy 
for us to think of Jesus in that way. That dying on the cross in amazing suffering and pain so that those who believe in him may not only have eternal life, but also a better and more successful one. Did you catch that? We want to think that Jesus died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. Y'all yeah, missing it. But Jesus said something different. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus reminds us not to think like a Korean parent. But Jesus tells us, whomever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. In other words, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. Jesus died on the cross one day so that we can choose to die on the cross every day. Like him. Y'all ain't hearing me right now. Jesus doesn't call us to take up our cross temporarily. Take it up on weekends. Take it up on holidays. Take it up on, on, on the days you need a miracle. Take it up on the days you need a breakthrough. Take it up on the days your children need prayer. No, he calls us to take up the cross daily. And in Luke, he tells us that he's giving us a strategy. Watch this. He's, I'm sorry, he's not giving us a strategy for enduring difficult times while we wait for God to resurrect us and give us greater blessing in this lifetime. That's not what he's doing. He's just not trying to bless us and make the eye bigger and give us all the better things our eye found out about ourselves. That's not what he's doing. Oh, that's a dangerous way to think. In, 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 the old, in the last days, perilous times, men will be in love with themselves in this eye. That's so dangerous to think that way. The danger is that we think that that's what Jesus is up to. But he's calling us not to gain life and to get more blessed and to get it better and more comfortable and more perfect for ourselves. He's calling us to lose our life for his sake. Y'all ain't here. He said anyone who's looking to save his life will lose it. I'm going to sound real old school here, but because you keep putting yourself first, you're going straight to hell. With all of your beliefs in Jesus, ain't none of those cognitive beliefs helped you to get your soul out of hell. Your soul is still stuck where it's always been. Your soul has never been denied. Your soul has never been put on a cross. Your soul does not know how to sacrifice itself daily because you want what you want the way you want it. You can't follow me. Any man want to be my disciple? Firstly, deny yourself. Get yourself out of here. Get your eye out of here right now. Secondly, take up your cross. Thirdly, take it up daily and follow me. You want to be with me? You want to follow me? You want to follow me and have my redemptive work operating in you? My work pulls your soul out of hell. But any man who wants to save his life will lose it. Any man who will lose his life or lose his eye-ism. His self-isms. Anyone who will lose that will gain his life for my sake. You'll find it. We were with Father John Bear a couple years ago, and we were sitting in sessions with him six, eight hours a day listening to this brilliant theologian of our day speak and teach and preach. And one of the things he said is that the life of the baptized Christian when you're baptized in Christ, baptism is a sign of death, you know. So the life of the Christian that is baptized is one of learning to die. Repeatedly, he kept telling us that you don't become alive in Christ till you really learn to die. Death is everything we're avoiding. Now y'all ain't hearing this. Death is everything we're avoiding because we have too many plans for ourselves. That's not Jesus' way, is it? Jesus laid down his self. Jesus laid down his own life for us. Y'all hearing this? He laid down his what? Own life for? Wait, wait. He gave up I for us? 
Y'all missing it. Yeah, I just don't want to be around church folk. I don't like them that much. I just don't like what church do. do you, know, you know, I just decided this is what I'm going to do. From now on, I'm just going to go in on Sunday, do what I got to do, get out, go home. Who, 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 who are you following? Because the Lord you follow laid down his eye for the us. Y- 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 y'all missing this. He says, he said, uh, I heard Pastor Tia said it, say it earlier in the service. When she, opened, when she was welcoming everyone, she, she quoted the psalmist when he said that the Lord is calling us to be like those who gather up under Aaron, where the oil falls on the head and runs down the beard, right? And it, and it started off by saying how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to be together, not isolated. But to gather us in, to give us an identity of wholeness, of collectivity. And it says there the Lord commands what? The blessing. He never, Jesus never did anything thinking about self. He died thinking about us. As a matter of fact, scripture says he never spoke. He said, I never speak on my own authority. If I don't hear and see the father saying it, I don't say it, I don't do it. And the spirit won't speak on his own authority. If the spirit don't hear it from us, he won't ever say it. How is it that you can run your mouth about everything you think? And every way it should be. Y'all ain't hearing this. And you have opinions about everybody and everything. And you can't get along. You got too big of a personality to serve on the same ministry team. Who taught you that way? Whose way are you following? Well, I said what I had to say, Bishop. You certainly did. Your eyes said everything. But you never spoke on behalf of us. You never spoke on behalf of the collective. You only spoke on your own behalf. You never thought about how that affected other people's feelings. You never thought about how others might perceive what you were saying. You just thought your opinion to be so important that you had to share it and damage the us. But Jesus was never like that. He acted on behalf of others. He did things on behalf of others. He said things on behalf of others. He lived and died on behalf of others. And he says, really, the entire law can really be summarized in love God and love others as you love what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's juxtapose juxtapose your I, yourself, with others. And if you're going to do that for yourself, be willing to do it for? And if you're going to say that for others, then be willing to say it for? Yourself, And if you can't do that, maybe you shouldn't be saying or doing it. Perilous times. Lovers of self. I started off real prophetic. I'm ending really pastorally. Because I got you thinking, and that's all right. That's where I want you to be. But Jesus is saying, whoever wants to be my disciple. If you're really trying to follow me, then the words of Father, there are true. Then you learn in this baptized life to learn to die daily. And so as I'm bringing this to a close, let me tell you a couple things. First thing you're going to need to do, and I hear this, is we're going to have to empty ourselves out of ourselves. Empty ourselves of ourselves. Y'all ain't hear this. Empty ourselves of ourselves. Hear me clearly. You cannot carry both the cross and yourself. Y'all missed it. You can't carry the cross and yourself. You can't carry both. You're going to have to choose which one am I going to (laughs) carry. 
Uh, this is such a basic word. I wanted a revival word. I wanted a conference word. How about if you kill self, then God will revive everything around you. Come on, somebody. How about if you get yourself out the way, then everyone else can come together. You can't carry both your cross and yourself. You can't have two masters. As long as we're carrying the self, we hate the cross. Y'all missed that. As long as we carry what? We hate. The cross is life-giving. Yourself is a killer. Yourself is a bolster. Yourself is unloving. Yourself will lead you to do things for yourself. Y'all ain't hearing this right now. Yourself loves money. Yourself loves avarice. Y'all ain't hearing this. Yourself. Someone say myself. Yourself will lead you into unforgiveness. Yourself will act unlovingly. Yourself will be brutal. Yourself will have no self-control. Yourself will be a traitor. Yourself will be a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. Yourself will act like you have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Yourself will never glorify Christ. The danger is that you're in love with yourself. You love to pamper yourself. You love to give it to yourself. You love to have yourself feel good. You love to feel yourself, don't you? You look in the mirror to feel yourself. Y'all ain't hearing this. You fish for compliments because you love yourself. You want recognition because you want yourself to be recognized for all yourself has done. The enemy is I. The enemy is self. My God, I hear the Lord speaking to somebody in here. If anybody, he's talking to me right now. It's either the tree of life or the tree of self-knowledge of good and evil. It's either his cross or it's yourself. We always put ourselves first. You know, let, let, me, let, me, let me give you one else, one, one other thing that Jesus said about, about being so in love with ourselves. Do you remember what he said over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 30? Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to depart into hell y'all ain't hearing this the question is how do I cut me out how do I cut myself out of this and cleave to the cross of Jesus y'all ain't hearing this the answer is in the question if you're asking me how do I cut myself out and cleave to Jesus' cross, the answer has been asked in the question, has been answered in the question. You cut yourself out by cleaving to the cross. It's when you cleave to the cross to the instrument of death. Y'all. The cross is for killing. The cross is for dying. The cross is for public shaming of the self. To make whatever is there suffer and die to the point where it is no more. No more among us. And can I say something to you? I love you, but I wish you die. I'm going to say it again. I love you, but I wish you die. Look at somebody, tell them, I love you, but I wish you die. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. Look at somebody else. Tell them, I love you, but I wish you died. My God, say it like you got some Holy Ghost sense and power. I love you, but I wish you died. Woo, I feel God when I say that. 
I feel closer to the cross when I say that. When I, when I, when I, what I really mean is I love you enough to see Christ live in you and not you live in you. What I really want to see is you die to yourself and Christ to raise up in you. What I want, you don't understand, but listen, the one thing that's been getting in the way of this ministry is my own self. God says one thing, I say another. The Holy Ghost moves one way, I move another. God wants one other, I say no, Lord. Oh, if I could just deal with myself. I feel like the Apostle Paul who writes the words and says, oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me? Who can deliver me from this body of death that I'm carrying all around? Everywhere I go, I carry death on me. My, 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 my. Look at somebody say, I love you, but I wish you would die. Yeah, 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 yeah. And don't you worry about who God is speaking to. The enemy is I. I said the enemy is I. The enemy is I. I don't know what you heard tonight. I don't know what God said to you tonight. I got too much on my own plate to be concerned about that. Right now, the enemy is I. Lord, how have I been opposed to you? Lord, how have I been in your way? Lord, how have I done everything wrong? Lord, tell me how I've done this to myself. And I've not only done it to myself, I've done it to you. I've done it to you. I've done it to you. I've done it to him. God is saying, I want you to come together. I want you to come together. Come to where I am. Come to where my people are. Come, mission is calling you. Come on, somebody. Come, mission is calling you. Ministry is calling you. Obedience is calling you. Come on, somebody. Sacrifice is calling you. Come, come, come. Come, life is calling you. Come, Service is calling you. Come. Fasting is calling you. Come. Holiness is calling you. Come. The Spirit is calling you. Come. But you'll have to die before you get here. I, I, I was explaining this the other day, Brandon. I was talking about Adam being put out of the garden who wants to be put out of the place where God is is, is present who, who wants to lose out on a sacred space who wants to not be where God is but God was so aware so aware of what had happened the enemy of all of God's plan had awakened in a bite y'all ain't y'all ain't y'all ain't, ain't hearing this he swallowed something he should have never swallowed. He tasted something he should have never tasted. And it wasn't the fruit of a tree. It was the fruit of his own self. Y'all got to hear this, hear this, hear this. Hear this. I got to say this quickly because we got to go. Remember when Jesus tried to heal the blind man or when he went to go heal the blind man? And as the blind man was being healed, he says, I see men as what? trees trees are always symbolic of man when man adam ate of the tree he was eating of him he was tasting himself therefore his eyes were open not the trees y'all catching this right now his eyes were open his soul was open his heart was open his knowledge was open and as soon as the self woke up it went against god and God said, I got to put you out this garden, Adam. Why? Because the one thing I told you not to do, you did. And now you live and I don't live in you. Y'all hearing this? The day you eat, you shall surely what? What was giving you life in the first place? My spirit. What's giving you life now? Your spirit. 
You invited death by awakening eye. You got to go. He put him out the garden. And the Bible says something that really stuns me. It says he put an angel at the place of the entrance to the garden. An angel. An angel. Messenger of the Lord. Servant of the Lord. You know, Paul writes about angels and said angels are pastors. They're preachers. They're bishops. When Jesus writes, tells John, write this to the angel of the church. The seven angels, the seven anagolos in Greek, he's not talking about physical, spiritual beings. He's talking about earthly angels. He's talking about those who lead the church as messengers and servants of God. The scripture says that God put a messenger. I, I, I need that Bible over there. Even if it's a hymn book, I need it. Oh, I got this one here. Never mind. I got this one here. He put at the gate a messenger with a sword in his hand. Catch, catch. A sword that cuts and pierces and separates the soul from the spirit. The I from the I am. Y'all catching this now? This one disentangles you from thinking you are the I am. No, you are an I, but you are not the I am. But this word will disentangle your soul from spirit. Trust me. It'll split it. He puts an angel. I mean, who doesn't want to come back in the garden? In perfect peace and fellowship with God where I no longer interrupts. Where life is flowing in the blessing. And Jesus, Jesus died on a tree because man lost his life on a tree Jesus gave his on one y'all catching this right now because the fruit of one tree killed the fruit of another had to bring life because the fruit of the first Adam killed the fruit of the last Adam had to bring life so he puts his own life y'all ain't hearing this y'all ain't hearing this I told you the fruit was his own self did I tell you the fruit was his own self and Jesus put the fruit back on the tree he dies y'all ain't hearing me they pierce his side because out of the side the bride has to be revealed y'all ain't hearing me it was in the garden that the bride came out it's on the new tree that the next bride has to come out and Jesus is there on the tree he said well what's the angel there for the angel is there with his sword to divide the eye from the I am you know, if I was out of the garden, if I was Adam, I'd want back in. I was taught that the reason the angel was there was to keep man out of the garden. The scripture does not say that the angel was there to keep man out of the garden. The scripture says that the angel was there to keep the way to the garden. Did y'all hear that? The word keep there in Genesis 4 is the same as the word keep in Genesis 2, where God told Adam to keep the garden and tend to it. It means to conserve. It means to enhance it. It means to keep it together. To keep it alive and well like you keep and tend to a garden. What is the angel there for? To keep man out? No, no, no. He's there to keep the way. Who is the way? What's the angel there for? To keep that way. To preserve the way. Why? But Adam can go back in. He sure can. Adam can come back any day he wants. He just chose not to. Why? Because to come back in, I'd have to use this sword on you. And if I use this sword on you, one of us ain't going to live. If I use this sword on you, you will have to die. The only way to come back in is through death. Y'all ain't understanding this. I use the word not to tickle you. That's for those who have itching ears. I use the word not to just help you. I use the word and hopefully what I'm doing tonight is I'm killing you right now. I'm not just here to cut you. This word is here to divide you. To cut yourself out of the way. And to preserve the way into the life of Christ. Because if you make it back in 
and you eat from this tree, you'll have life evermore. Well, isn't that what Jesus came to give us? He came to give us what? Life and that we should have it more abundantly. So how do I get the life of Jesus? Adam, you're asking? Come back in. But this time, let the angel cause you to lose your eye. To lose yourself. To lose your life. Lift your hands if you're seeing this picture right now. The enemy is I. What's keeping you from the tree is I. And God is calling you, saying, come. I'm calling you to come together. Come to where I am. Come to the place where I am. Father, I pray. Come on, stand with me. Lift your hands with me. Father, I pray tonight that you would cause this radical individualism the self that is interrupting how we think, how we act, how we behave. We don't live communally. We live individually. We don't worship communally. We do it individually. We don't pray communally. We do it individually. We've not learned to live this life the way you want us to. Help us to lose the eye. Disentangle us from self. Everybody watching right now, lift your hands wherever you are. Lift your hands online. Lift your hands. I pray yourself dies right now. I love you, but I hope you die. I hope you die. I hope the Holy Spirit takes his sword to your heart, to your mind, to your soul. I hope God causes divine death. That you might speak like Paul. I no longer live. Look at somebody. Tell them I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Uh, so help us to deny self. To take up our cross. And to die daily. I'm over my time. I'm over my time. But let the Lord just, come on, just wave your hands. Let the Lord have his way. To every way that you yourself have been sabotaging the work of God in your life. You yourself sabotaging the community of Jesus you yourself with your own hangups and your own filters and your own ways of thinking with your opinions with your behavior with your attitudes with your self absorption it's good to be self aware but don't let it become evil So, Father, deliver us, free us, help us. I pray in Jesus' name.